trip. It's been an amazing. I like everything. Just every each day was like better than the last. I realized that God has actually shifted some things in my in the way I see Israel and and Jewish people. They're amazing, beautiful people, and I'm, uh, I have uh, I have something now to when when we're praying for Israel. I actually know what I'm praying for, and I, that's beautiful. It's amazing to me just that God would continue to to bless you and prosper you and protect you, and the light from here would go, you know throughout all the world so hopefully we can do this with our children someday that's what i'm hoping for good, good morning. morning we are in fact in israel this morning we're walking to where babe uh to spring of david yeah right? spring of david mm -hmm. and in this area here it's an oasis and we stayed at a kibbutz last night and tonight we'll be staying there it's called uh kibbutz and getty and a kibbutz is a place where they're uh the jewish community they're, I guess, looking at something. I'm not sure what it is. A Jewish community lives in a kind of common, common area. Um, and I think this spring is where David hid from Saul. Right. Yeah. Right. Hid. Yeah. While Saul was hunting him, uh, he was hid in this area. Um, mm -hmm. So we were going to go all the way up to where there's some waterfalls, but it rained just a little bit during the night, and unfortunately, there's a danger of flash floods, so we can't we can't can go all the go way. To the first yeah. One, so which isn't quite as that's nice, a bummer. But, um, Anyways, we just wanted to say, hey, we're we're hiking here. It's uh, really cool. It's totally sandstone cliffs everywhere we look, but right in this area because the water is green. And so that's what we're doing today. And then what are we doing next after this? We're going to Masada. That's right. right. Yeah, this yeah. is an old Roman fortress, and we'll tell you more about it when we get there. Yeah. And then... After that, we're going to go float in the Dead Sea. Yes. I'm excited about that. Yeah, and we've been seeing some Ibex around here. There's some uh, Hyrex. Hyrax, those are like a mountain conies, uh, like little, and these are both mentioned in the Psalms. Anyways, we'll show you a little bit of the scenery and what's happening. So I think this is now called the stream or the spring of David. This is one of three waterfalls, but we're only gonna be able to visit this one. fortress that we're going to be walking up on right up the front of that thing so this is the group that's going to be walking up there are you ready for this babe i am all right let's well, do it I think I am. there's like 16 or 18 of us that are coming right, here we go we're going to take off running all the way to the top if we can Okay, not much for my ego. Ay, ay, ay. It's been a while since hunting season. I'm stuck in there like, I'm at 10,000 feet. I don't know what's going on. Anyways, I guess I'll just enjoy the view. Run when I can, walk when I must. We're getting there. I think we're probably, oh, appear to be over halfway now. Still sucking wind, running a little bit, walking mainly. Got a couple of guys in front of me. This is no race, but you know the male species. Everything is considered a race, but it is what it is. I can't catch up. Woo, it's warm, it's probably, 80 degrees at least. I'm sweating like you wouldn't believe. Check it out.
climb of the last steps. I'm shot, man. I'm so shot. Happy to be up here. Okay, getting my wits back together now. That was intense. Whoa. I couldn't believe it. It felt like I was hiking at 10,000 feet. I don't know what's going on. Below sea level. It's like I couldn't get enough oxygen. Just crazy. But uh, made it. It's good to accomplish this. Can always say I made it to the top of Masada. At least I didn't stop. I didn't run, but I didn't stop anytime. So, yeah, pretty amazing up here. Now we got to go check out some of the ruins up here. One lone tree growing up here on the top of Masada. What a amazing sight. Looks like they water it to keep it alive. Well, now I'm waiting on Priscilla. Priscilla and uh, there's like a bunch of us that are walking up, so Priscilla should be here shortly. I'm gonna keep an eye out for her. There she comes. Good job, babe. Long, long ways up here. Doing all right, babe? Huh? Doing all right? I'm all right. I'm just red. <laughs> yeah, hiking red. <laughs> There's the Dead Sea. We're going to be soaking in that after a bit here, and that's going to feel really good. Woohoo! Made it. Good job, girl. Yep. About the meaning of the word Masada. Fortress. Fortress. So uh, we built a fortress when you're afraid that somebody will attack you right and you want to be and you want to be protected from that somebody so who's the person that built this fortress and against whom did he try to protect himself please leona king herod built it again not against the romans not against the romans against the, the zealots exactly the uh, story of um around the time when Jesus was here. Jesus was just a generation after uh, after uh, Herod. Uh, around that time is that uh, Jews, this country is occupied by Rome and there are Jews who are, you know, uh, allies with the Romans and uh, live good life. Jews that say it is what it is, you know, we can't fight against them so we have to just take it as it is. And Jews that said, no, 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 this is against God's will. God doesn't want us to be subjects of the Romans. We need to kick them out of here. And these are the zealots. Okay, so the zealots were here for a long time. Uh, but, um, but the government always tried to oppress them. So how did Herod become a king? He went to the Romans, to Mark Antony, their emperor at the time, and said to him, uh, if you make me governor of my country, I'll take care of the zealots for you. Instead of you having to send people from Rome or from wherever to fight against those Jewish zealots. I know the country, I know the language, I know the people. I can do it much, much better job if you let me be the king there. So uh, Mark Anthony said, sure, why not? And this is how Herod got his position as a king, but not as an independent king. He wasn't the, uh, the sovereign here. The sovereign was the Romans. He ruled in their behalf. But it is sometimes happened when, you know, a subject of somebody becomes a, a, is very talented and he makes a name for himself. Herod, uh, at the time when he was a king here, he developed the country like nobody before or after him until modern time. Nobody really was a builder like he did, like he was. Nobody was a developer like he was. And nobody was as cruel as he was. Or maybe people were as cruel as he was, but uh, uh, we don't know much about them. So one of the things that uh, he always uh, took in consideration is that uh, one day the, Roman, the zealots might win. And if they will, he needs to defend himself, he needs to protect his family, his loyal people. And therefore he built fortresses in different parts of the country and Masada is one of them. It's uh, quite clear why he chose this place. Those of you who walked up uh, understand that this is very, very difficult to conquer a place like this, especially if somebody is sitting at above and throwing rocks at you. They don't even have to fight. They just kind of like have to roll 
the rocks at you, and it's what we call Jewish bowling. <laughs> we, uh, uh, right? So uh, uh, this is not the only fortress that Herod built, but it's probably the most magnificent one, or one of the most magnificent ones. And uh, uh, in, uh, besides the fact that this is a cliff that is so uh, flat, there's also, uh, um, it's qu I'm sorry, it's quite, quite steep. It's also a little bit flat on top. So you can actually use the space here for development. So when Herod uh, decided to make a, a fortress here, what did he really need? He needed three things. The first thing is a wall to uh, protect the edge of the mountain. And so what you see in front of you here, these are the remains of the wall. Uh, so this is the first thing that you need when you build a fortress. What is the second thing? You need storage of water and, f water and food. Because the easiest way to take down a fortress is not by conquering it, by starving the people who are there uh, to death. Okay, so uh, uh, if you're a fortress engineer and you want to build a fortress, the one thing that... Uh, uh, the first thing that you would know about a fortress is that the walls will help you for as long as the enemy is out. But the minute the enemy already broke in, you, this is a trap. You have no, re no place to run to. So every good fortress engineer will do what I call a second defense line. Right? So if Masada down there is the whole space, the wall that we just crossed down here is a second defense line. And you can see it here, this line here. Okay, now uh, you would want to, put, to fortify it in every way you can. First, of course, is to build a wall. Second is to build a watchtower. And third is to dig a moat, a canal. A canal that goes from one side to the other. What we see here, that the project really was never completed. They started to dig the moat. They ended here, which is just below us. We just crossed it over there. Uh, uh, and that tells us that, uh, you know, they would have continued. I told you it took three generations to, uh, for Herod's family to be here. So this is the defense system of what they call the second defense line. Behind that, or oh here, this is the villa of the, of the manager, the, uh, I don't know what, and this is the office. This is where we are now at. And all these are food stores, here and here. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, almost 20. And you can see the size of them. If they are full with food from floor to bottom, I mean from floor to top, they, uh, uh, they contain tons and tons and tons of food. All this had to be imported to here. How did it come? On camel's back. Mm -hmm. So think of those trains that I told you, those caravans, right, that cross the roads of the, of the world. And of course, uh, food has an expir expiration date. So whenever a store... Uh, had to be, uh, uh, the food that was stored there had to be uh, taken out. They just would take everything out, would refill it. So this is, of course, of the whole time work. About water, um, Ben asked me about water, and um, I can show it to you here. Uh, and then we'll see the original as well. They had the water systems on this level. Okay, here. And the water came from, by an aqueduct from a nearby river. And this was a water path. Can you see this? So slaves would live here every morning on mules, with mules, and would walk a very, very steep slope, even more st steeper than what you walked, to the water cistern, fill up the, uh, the buckets or whatever the, the mules carried, come back up and dump it on cisterns that were here. Why is it important? Because cisterns, uh, are refilled by the rain, and it hardly ever rains here. So when the enemy will come, the first thing that they will do, they'll cut the water supply. You, and if it's in the end of the summer, you have no water up here. So you want to always have the cisterns full, and this is really a full-time, again, full-time work that they came from bottom to top, from top from bottom, from morning till night, every day, bringing water from the big cisterns down here to here, and then from here they will take it this was the spa, this uh, building over there, and um, uh, two other water facilities that they needed. Let's, uh, uh, just the last thing is that this is the other palace, Herod's Palace, 
on three different levels. The wall that comes from the right and the wall that comes from the left, they meet here. And so this would be the best, the best place with view, also uh, better breathe. And in, at noontime, here there's shade, because the sun is here. So what Herod wanted is a palace that will be hanging over the cliff. They cut the mountain in three different levels and put buildings on top, in the middle, and below. So there you can see the palace going down through there. Just look at that. Ay, ay, ay. This is freaky. Hanging over the edge of the cliff. I imagine whoever lived here felt pretty good about themselves. Here's one of the cisterns that they filled with water from the bottom. We're gonna ride this cable car down now and uh, take it down. Rather than hiking back down, that'll be nice. They jammed this thing full, like 69 people in here last time. All right, they got us packed into like sardines. <laughs> We thank you and hope you enjoyed your visit to Masada National Park. We look forward to seeing you again soon. So we're here at a resort by the Dead Sea. And it's just incredible, just beautiful. Lots of food for lunch. And then we're gonna go soaking in the Dead Sea. And I guess it has, it's very healing because it has so many minerals in it. So I'm looking forward to it. Here we are at the Dead Sea. And it doesn't look like there's anybody here, but believe me, there's quite a few people here. Uh, I'll show you around real quick. Dead Sea behind me, and we're at this beautiful motel. <coughs> Excuse me. And there's a beach. It's a sandy beach. It's beautiful, beautiful. That meal was delicious. It's a big hotel. You can lay out on the beach here. So it's time to get soaking. I just had to take you out here and show you they're having so much fun, literally just floating on the Dead Sea. I gotta get out there. <laughs> oh my. And you almost can't get yourself back up once you lay back and float. And what is so cool about it, it's so, it has so many minerals in it and it's so good for your body. And there she is, the queen of floaties. <laughs> Ooh, this is amazing. Just amazing. Just absolutely impossible to not float out here. It's just phenomenal. Pretty amazing. You don't want to get it in your eyes. Yeah, it burns At like fire. <laughs> We're actually standing on the bottom, but it's pretty much impossible to. You get about up past where I'm standing right now, and your feet just come off the floor, just off want the to ground. Float. Yep. Oh, this is awesome. <laughs> it is. Ooh, we got caught in a rainstorm. <laughs> I got it. I'm thinking this is pretty unusual. This is in the desert. What is it right in the desert? <laughs>
Well, that was fun, was it not? <laughs> oh, it was amazing. Yes. And now we're back. We cleaned up. And... You can see she really cleaned up. I didn't so much. <laughs> she cleaned it up really well. Oh. My beautiful wife. <laughs> hey, we're uh, look at this beautiful view behind us. This is literally out um, yeah. the back of our uh, little place that we're staying here in En Gedi. Uh -huh. And now we're going to go have some dinner. Oh, no. What are we going to do first? We're going to first go see their botanical garden. Yeah, right? that, that sounds amazing. And I'm looking forward to that. Dusk, so I yeah. wonder how we're going to do that. But maybe they have lots they of lights. They have a plan, I guess. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> then we're going to go eat, and then we're done for the day. So it was a jam-packed full day. It was, it was amazing. Day. Yep. <laughs> All right, let's go check out the botanical gardens. This is amazing that somebody could build something like this in such a place like this. This is just pretty phenomenal. The specialty of our garden has to do with two main elements. One is the high quality of the spring water that we have here in I the noticed, oasis. I the water was good, really good water. The water is sweet, mm -hmm. very low um, amount of uh, salts in it. Mm. So this is good for many plants. Second thing, which is even much more important, is the fact that the, the winter is warm. Mm -hmm. You know, usually never gets under 10 Celsius, which makes us able to grow here plants that no other place in Israel will be able to survive the mild winter even of Tel Aviv. So that's why we have so many special plants. And we are starting with a plant that has an historical story. Okay, what I advise you to do, <coughs> this very, very modest bush, Take a branch with leaves, don't pick them, but hold it strong in your fist and smell your hand. This is one of the species of myrrh, M-Y-R-R-H, a plant of incense, medicine, cosmetics and perfumes. The famous Ooh. balsam mm -hmm. came from these kind of bushes. Wow. Now, the material that is so impressive. Now, we know that here in Engedi, people 3,000 years ago were growing the henna. How do we know it? Bible. We take the most beautiful book of the Bible, the love poetry, Songs of Songs, or Songs of Solomon. I don't know how you know it. Mm -hmm. In the first chapter, there is a sentence that says exactly like this. My beloved one is to me like a cluster of henna blossoms in the vineyards of Engedi. Oh, wow. Nothing more clear than that. <laughs> Good morning. It's Good morning. another beautiful day here in the in Engedi, here in Israel. And we're just heading for breakfast. Uh, we've stayed here two nights and we're going to go to Jerusalem today mm -hmm. um, while we're walking here to our hotel uh, to our, our where well, we're gonna have breakfast here mm -hmm. the dining room I just want to show you these beautiful uh, botanical areas that they have here planted it's really amazing um, it's we're just it's just like loaded with palms and all kinds of amazing flowers and cactuses because we're right in the middle of the desert it never freezes here and then I'll turn the camera around and I'll show you the other side. It, this morning it's completely blue skies. Just and it's just like these crisp blue skies against this brown sandstone uh, cliffs. It's pretty awesome. It's really beautiful. So look at that. Look at how blue and browns and tans and there's a spring down in there. They're literally up here on the cliff. It's a Jewish kibbutz. And now let's look at some of these plants that they have here. Cactus, I don't even know what they all are, but just loads of greenery. Little places to sit and enjoy. I can hear the drip irrigation going here. Lots of flowers. 
and this is their fall season so it, things aren't blooming quite as much as they normally would look at this cactus right here that's amazing got white flowers on it big palm trees other leaf trees amazing well this morning we are hiking up to King David Spring once again the same thing we did yesterday because we had a little bit of rain they were concerned about flash floods and it's so cool because there's nobody up here today yesterday there was loads of people and see all these little ibex around here they're pretty cool these are females right here and I see a male up in this tree let's see if we can see his horns there he is look at that big guy that's pretty neat well let me show you the group of our group here does it make our way up here I think there's 26 of us all total most of them are from mm, about two-thirds I guess are from the our Montana community my brother my sister my father-in-law brother-in-law another brother-in-law sister-in-law yep and then the different ones from the community and such it's a beautiful day this morning well here we were yesterday and there was loads of people this morning there isn't anybody we're making our way up this canyon completely desert but lush right here where the creek is year-round spring and then we're looking right out to the Dead Sea which looks so beautiful they've got quite the steps carved into the hill here oh they laid them in I think yep For our desert, this is quite a deal. Wow, if I'd have been King David, I think I just kind of laid down here and taken it easy in the shade all day long. This is nice. Oh, wow. This is neat. Wow, I like this. It's actually kind of cool down in here. Wow, this is amazing actually. Wow. Very nice down in here. Nice and cool. Wow. Check it out. This is neat. I like it. A tunnel made of grasses. Creek running through it. Smells a little strange. Kind of like wet grass. Maybe like some Ibex live here sometimes. And I think this might be the waterfall. Wow. No way. Amazing. Streams in the desert. Look at that. Amazing. Look at that big boulder up there. It looks like it could just kind of roll off of there, maybe. Ravens up there. Wow, and there it is. The big one. That is amazing. 
tall waterfall. Okay, so we're here at this site where the Dead Sea Scrolls were found, and I'm not a, a biblical scholar, so I'll try to repeat what I understand this is, so if I say some things that are not completely accurate, forgive me, is I'm going from memory what I know, but these uh, caves right down here, these were the ones, uh, some of the caves that the Dead Sea Scrolls were discovered in, and this place that we're standing was, um, it was kind of like a compound, and, and these people were known as the a scenes and the reason that uh, they disappeared from this place is that they uh, they believe that when the Romans were marching down to Masada where we were yesterday they actually fled this place and went to Masada because they knew they would be killed but while they were here their library was the most precious thing they had so they took their all their library which was scrolls and they hid them in, in caves around the area and this is where the Dead Sea Scrolls were were held uh, where they were found. Now, some of the interesting things about this place is the uh, Essenes were known as the children of light, and they, they believed that you were either born evil or born good, and they understood that there was a God in heaven, and they believed there was a, a false God or a, an evil God, but they believed that they were the only true people, and that they were people of the light. And so uh, they built this wall around them so nobody could come in. Nobody that was evil, supposedly, could come in here and contaminate them. So they were their own sect, their own belief. And even Jesus referred to them uh, in the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus said, you know, it has been said, uh, you know, love your neighbors and hate your enemies. Um, because there's no, there's actually no place uh, in the Old Testament that it says that. But they discovered these words in the Dead Sea Scrolls. So Jesus knew about this and he uh, objected to this uh, philosophy that they had here. So, um Anyways, that, that's some history here. So we're gonna go over and we're gonna check out where the library was at in this compound. Very interesting place, right next to the Dead Sea, a beautiful place, uh, but just rich in history and very interesting indeed. One other thing that they believe in is that uh, whenever something happened that made them impure, like going to the bathroom or et cetera, things like that, they had to go, go and cleanse themselves. And so they would go one at a time and they would, in the midst of it in the bath, and they would uh, wash and they would be clean again because they believe there were people that were uh, clean. And so what, what this big cistern is, is they, they wanted to be ready when God comes back to get, the, to get all of them. So they created this big cistern. So if they knew that God was coming back, they would all jump in and be clean. And then they would be uh, clean to go with God, which is obviously a false mentality because of what happened. So, but anyway, it's very interesting that, to see this and to understand what these people thought. Well, we're here at a place where we're going to be riding some camels. Uh. There's Paul and Elizabeth. Ride him, cowgirl. Cowboy. Hi. <laughs> Okay. Oh, <laughs> 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 <laughs>
So we're sitting in a tent here and kind of reenacting how Abraham used to do it, you know, right. hospitality whenever visitors came by. They're going to have feed us lunch here. We're seated at this low table right here, sitting on some cushions. Sodom and Gomorrah, you've heard of it? The good news is I understand his wife did become quite a pillar of the community there. So the salt of the earth, as they say. That'll teach you to turn your back on things too quickly. Now, in a moment, Eliezer's going to come out. And the first thing you're going to see is water. Why would a wealthy man present you first thing with just water? Where are we today? In the desert. Can anybody survive in my tent without water? No. So in a sense, I'm offering you life itself. But you guys are kings and queens, so you get lemonade also. <laughs> so they're bringing us all these things to eat. I guess we just dig in. I'm not sure. What is this? I don't know. Bread and pickles. Salads. <laughs> Jump on there. So where do you want these? Well, no, nowhere. You better just hang on. Okay. Do you want to go? You can come right up. You can come to this one. Okay. Huh? Aye, aye, aye. Sorry about that. <laughs> Well, here we go. What do you think, babe? <laughs> A new experience I never had. <laughs> All right, not so close to me, buddy. Yeah, this is pretty fun. We're out here in Israel enjoying a camel ride. I came to Israel 39 years ago. I came from Ethiopia. Uh, from Ethiopia, we walked to Sudan. Uh, we walked for 12 days to get to Sudan. Yeah. So uh, the family at the time was, was still small. It was only uh, Adina, her husband, two older daughters. I mean, the two oldest daughters that she, uh, that she had at the time and her mother that came with them. Her mother already passed away since yeah, they, uh, they, uh, all together, there are about 1,000 people that left at the same time with them. Wow, what an interesting story this lady had. Kind of to put it in a nutshell here, she, her whole family came from Ethiopia, the Ethiopian Jews, and they walked through the desert, got robbed by bandits, and many, many people died. They went all the way to Sudan lived there in a refugee camp for a year and eventually moved to Israel and that was her story just quite a moving story wow it's amazing <coughs> so so good to hear from her and now it's off to the next thing and here we are in Jerusalem yes we're on the top of the Mount of Olives right now overlooking the city yeah. and you can see uh, all of this I think this is like the best viewpoint of Jerusalem right in this area so we're going to be spending the next few days here and looking forward to seeing all there is to see, all that we get to see. So this is just the first stop. So join us and we'll go take a tour. Uh, stood somewhere here on the Mount of Olives and this is pretty much what he saw with some changes. First of all, the city was not as huge as it is today. All this that you see now that is Jerusalem back at the time was much smaller and it was surrounded by a wall. Second, uh, where you see the Golden Dome now, that is a huge and beautiful uh, Muslim shrine. 
Back at the time, there was a big Jewish temple that stood up here. Uh, but the plaza on which uh, the dome stands on, the whole big plaza where the trees are to the right and to the left, all this already existed at the time. Um, and uh, part of it, especially the one further to the left, was the market where the money changers were. So when Jesus came to Jerusalem, he stood up here. He saw the Jewish temple in front. And remember, he didn't come alone. He came with a lot of people from Galilee that uh, believed that he was Mashiach and that he was going to make some kind of a miracle and the Romans are going to disappear. Now, uh, uh, they, those people that came with Jesus were not the only people here. Uh, this was one of the Jewish pilgrimage holidays when tens of thousands of Jews from all over the country messed here in Jerusalem. They, uh, what you see here now is nothing compared to how many people stood here at the time. So those who came with Jesus from Galilee and believed that he was Mashiach, uh, they told everyone of, you know, this man is going to get the Romans out and you should see he does miracles, he walks on water, he calms the storm, he heals people, he can do everything. So, uh, and he is also a son of David and soon he will, he will um, assume the throne of his father and we will have our kingdom like we had in biblical time and uh, wow, it's going to be so great. And so when Jesus comes into Jerusalem, they put him on a donkey like uh, a royal entrance. They put their clothes on the floor. They hold uh, palm leaves on both sides. And they, uh, and they beg him. What do they say to him? Save us. You know his name was, what was his name? Yeshua. And Yeshua means salvation. And Oshana means save us. Save us from what? From the Romans, right? They were sure that uh, those who came with him, they were sure that this was going to happen. They called him the king of the Jews because they, he was related to David. So they thought that, you know, he's going to be the next king of Jerusalem. But definitely Jesus was not here for that. He knew what he's here for. He was here to be crucified. But except of him and a couple of the, couple of the disciples that he told that this was going to happen, they really did not know what was going on. Everybody thought that you know, the miracle is going to happen in a second. So they are so happy. And all the Jews that came, not only Jesus and Jesus' people, but everyone that came, they actually aimed towards the temple. The plaza where the trees are now was uh, uh, over, overwhelmed with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, pilgrims. They all stood around the temple. The temple in the middle, nobody would, was allowed in. That was the house of God. So only the coins thought that worked in the temple were allowed in, but everybody else were messed around. And there were prayers and there were uh, uh, the coins. They blessed the people. They sacrificed on the altar over there. And when Jesus came and he saw that this is, except instead of being a house of God, becomes kind of like a, a, a barbecue, a barbecue together with, uh, together with the business. He got very upset. He uh, started to yell at the business people here. He says, this is, you know, this is a house of God. You need to behave like this is a house of God.